everyone. Welcome to another episode of Thunderstruck. Our look back at the life, career, the greatest matches of one Jushin Thunder Liger. My name is W.H. Park. I do the Post Perez uh, podcast with John Pollock here at postwrestling.com. Of course, John's not here on this episode. He, he's going to appear on a future episode, people. Don't worry about that. You're, you're going to hear him and I talk about uh, one of... Liger's greatest matches probably near the end of the series might save John for the last last episode because like that's that's kind of how it goes got to save the the most important guest well not the most important guest but you know you know what I mean he's my regular co-host I gotta keep him special but anyways I'm rambling here joining me today I'm very excited actually a very special guest today he is uh the uh, co-host of the uh, grapple app spotlight he's uh he's also been a guest on my previous series cruel summer he is uh who uh, I, I've I've been told is the Takamichinoku of British broadcast uh, British wrestling podcasting. <laughs> uh, JP, JP, how are you? Oh, uh, I'm very well, and I'm more than happy to be the Takamichinoku of uh, of British and European podcast wrestling podcasting. Should, should I, should that's, you, that's a wonderful honor. Should I give you the backstory on that? <laughs> Please do. Yeah. So, so I don't know if you listened to one of the more recent episodes of uh, Post Perez of as of this recording, which so like uh, Benno. Your 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 co-host over at uh, Grapple Spotlight, and of course co-host at British Wrestling Experience, uh, is is uh, the co-host of uh, episode two, which is covers Brian Danielson uh, versus Jason Liger at Weekend of Thunder, uh, an ROH show, and and uh, this is this pairing of me and Benno is apparently John Pollock's like dream pairing of of podcasters, and and <laughs> and, uh, and so you know he was like saying it's like. It's I remember like, him saying. It, it's like we are the Chris Jericho and Eddie Guerrero of podcasting. Uh, you know, and I'm like, okay, but so Benno has to be Chris Jericho and I have to be Eddie Guerrero. So I was bringing this up with uh, our, with your fellow Irishman, uh, Jamesy. And, and we, were trying to, we were trying to figure out who's everyone else in, 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 uh, in, in uh, British, <laughs> British wrestling podcasting. Okay, so y- you're, you're Taka Michinoku. Okay. Okay. And and I think your co- other co-host Joe Lemon is Asushi Onita because he's a wild man. That sounds good. Yep. Yep. And, can definitely go alongside and, that. And, and and Will Cooling is Hiroshi Hase because of all the politics that he likes to talk about. Uh, yep. Yeah, that's that's very very good. Yeah, I think I like we, that. We declared that Alan Farrell is uh, Mitsuhara Masawa. Yes, he is. Oh, yeah. Get, yeah, yeah, Masawa, yeah. I, I hope you're okay with being Taka. I'm absolutely fine with being Taka. I am. I'm absolutely. Although he's gone from New Japan now, isn't he? he had the whole, there was a whole wow. whole controversy with him. Wow. Well, which likes, is he likes to open does happen to me. Well, he likes to have sex with people who aren't his wife. So you know. Yeah, he really does, doesn't and he? Gets, he? And gets caught. So that that's the problem with with good old Taka there. But anyways, that's that's neither, not me. That's oh. neither here nor. Well, I hope not. <laughs> neither here nor there. Uh, so let's. Talk about before we get to the match that you picked. I want to know, JP, uh, about mm-hmm. what does Jushin Thunder Liger mean to you as a wrestling fan? Um, he means quite a lot because for me, as like an, a, my real gateway into kind of loving wrestling outside of watching sort of world of sport as a very young child was WCW and WCW Worldwide. And one of the things you got was clips from some of the big super cards as well. So you'd be intrigued by seeing um, Jushin Liger. And he looked completely unlike anything else I'd ever seen before in the wrestling ring, doing moves that I hadn't seen, you know, because obviously we're, we're talking sort of the very early 90s here. Um, and he completely blew my mind. And I hadn't, if I'd seen him in World of Sport, it wasn't something that necessarily stood out. So for me, he was like kind of fresh, exciting, dynamic, he, how I felt about him is how I felt about Muta. And for me, they've always sort of held those special places in my heart because of that kind of, he, he harks back almost to, to my childhood. And then it's kind of cemented um, the first time when I saw the match he had with Pillman at Super Brawl um, and, and kind of like blew my mind. You know, I kind of like the tag team he had with Pillman, uh, like in the NWA yeah. World Tag Team title tournament. And they, they had... A match against Steamboat and Nikita Koloff that I really like. Uh, I don't remember if they took on one of your favorite tag teams, Doc, Doc and Gordy, in that. Oh. I don't know if they made it that far to, to facing them. I can't remember off the top of my head. But um, that was a great tag team, like Pillman and, and Liger, of course, great rivals as well. I do think when he came to England, like he did excursion in England mm. early in his career, I think he went to All Star Wrestling. 
he was, yeah. With uh, I think yeah. Brian Dixon was the promoter of that, right? Yeah, it would have been it would have been Brian Dixon, and he would have been. I'm trying to think of what the name of Daddy's promotion was. Um, I don't want to say it was not an Empire Wrestling. Um, I forget the name of it. But yeah, there was the. I think he would have done. He would have done the excursion with that. Whether or not he would have even worked at all for them, because there's, there's there is sort of videotape that exists of him out there. But um, it's funny at that point in time like going to see wrestling live was never even something that was kind of entertained as an option. It wasn't even something that was promoted on the TV show and they're getting like, you know, sort of 10 to 15 million viewers a week. And you wouldn't even know if there was a, a show in the next town to where, where you were living. So yeah, but um, so it would have been quite wild to have gone to a show as a child, being able to see um, um, uh, Liger working as a, a as Yamada, was it Yamada? What did he work as? Flying in the Kid, UK? I think Flying Kid Yamada. Flying Kid Yamada. That's what I'm going to go yeah. with that, yeah. I think that was his gimmick name back in uh, his UK excursion, excursion days. And then I think he, he might have done something similar when he was in uh, Calgary because he also did excursion yeah. for uh, Stu Hart's uh, Stampede Wrestling down in Calgary, I, which is my my theory is that that's where he met like people like Chris Benoit and Brian Pillman and, and Owen Hart and everyone else that would be involved with mm-hmm. you know, Stampede Wrestling uh, in the like I guess mid to late eighties. That would they would all be kind of starting around the same time as Liger. Um, so let's talk about then the match that you picked. What tell us, JP? What match of Ligers did you want to talk about with me? So I've picked the match um, against uh, Yoshinibu uh, Kanemaru from Noah Departure 2004, um, which was like the first big Noah show that I ever saw. Um, I believe it was the first Dome show that, that they had run. Um, and yeah, that's that's the one I've gone with. Yeah, so that, that occurred on July 10th, 2004 at the Tokyo Dome. And you're correct. Uh, the departure show is the first ever uh, NOAA Tokyo Dome show. They did one more a year later. And I think they've only done – they only did two in their history. Mm. They're unlikely to do another one ever again, <laughs> let's be honest. Uh, yep. No offense to all the NOAA fans listening to this right now. Sorry, but I'm just <laughs> speaking to the truth there. And this was for the uh, GHC, Junior Heavyweight title. And, and Liger was a champion at this time. Uh, he had defeated uh, Takashi Sugiera, who is now a you know, heavyweight legend for, for Noah, uh, back on January 4th, 2004, uh, at uh, New Japan's own Tokyo Dome show, which is, their, of course, their annual event at that building. And uh, this match against Kanemaru is his fifth defense. And yeah, Kanemaru is going for his third rank because he is a perennial, you know, GHC Junior Heavyweight title holder in the company. And yeah, so you have like this kind of story, like Liger is the invader from Japan. He's the champion mm. and, and he's de- he's defeated like four other challengers who can't take the belt off him. So like Kanemaru is like the, the great Noah hope to get this this very, you know, very important title because the junior heavyweight division in Noah is super hot, is super popular. And it, and it, it was a, a legit draw. For the company yeah yeah absolutely i mean especially you know the match before then and you've got the uh the i think is it sugura and uh kendo kashin versus kenta and marafuji on before it as well and that's that's an, an, a great match to go go and seek out especially the sort of crowd heat at that point in time um and the way that they positioned kanamari here because he was the inaugural holder of of the ghc title uh, junior title belt is someone who He's very much, you know, in terms of his facials and, and almost the way that, that he carries himself, there's a sort of very workmanlike yet sort of slight underdog feel to him at this stage in time and, and how he presents himself, which kind of worked perfectly because um, Liger's got this, he's in, he's in Liger dick mode and it's, it's kind of fun. He's really enjoying himself and he's enjoying the fact that he's coming out and being booed and, um, and it's yeah, it's just an absolutely cracking atmosphere. It is. It, it, this is like a super hot. This is kind of like the peak of Noah's popularity, two thousand four, yeah. two thousand and five, and and this crowd is just so hyped to be in the Tokyo Dome, not for a New Japan show, but for, for a Noah show because like no, Noah fans are very <clears throat> like loyal. Like you don't see too much crossover between promotions. Like a lot of New Japan fans are are strictly New Japan fans. A lot of All Japan fans are strictly All Japan fans and Noah fans are Noah fans and so forth and so on. So this is clearly a very like super heavy Noah, you know, Noah crowd. They're 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 biased towards Kanemaru and they're biased against Liger. And it's an interesting dynamic 
as well that, you know, normally Kanemaru's like uh, affiliation is with uh, Jun Akiyama's Sternus stable. And like mm. at this point, like Akiyama's kind of a heelish character because he had turned on, you know, Kobashi in the early days of, of Noah. And he kind of positions himself as a guy who's going to get to the top by by kind of like going against the established guys of Kobashi and Mitsuharu Masawa. And, and Kanemaru really played a really excellent heel foil to people like Kenta and to people like Kotaro Suzuki and to people like, you know, Naomichi Marafuji, who was like the junior ace at the time and the ultimate mm. baby face in Noah at the time. So it's an interesting dynamic that because Liger is the invader, who's normally the biggest baby face in the junior division in New Japan... But now in, in this, he's the invader, so he's the heel. And you're like you're saying, he's he's playing it up. And he's really great at playing it up. In in the previous episode of, of uh, Thunderstruck, I talked with uh, Jamesy, and we, we talked about the great Sasuke match and how Liger did everything in his power to turn a pro New Japan crowd against him and to cheer for the the outsider the, from Michinoku Pro, the great Sasuke, and how he did a masterful job at, job at that. So in this situation where he is actually the invader this time like it's, it's just for him he must be like loving it okay this is going to be so much easier than being a heel against great sasuke at the, the super uh the super j cup in 1994 so that's kind of the setting we have here for this match and let's get mm. into talking about the match jp so it starts off uh really really fast and really big it, gets, it goes for epic right away so like right out of the gates uh katamaro like just charges at Liger and kicks him right in the face. And it's it's beautiful. Uh, like, hold on. So he just, yeah, he kicks him in the face. And then Liger counters uh, back at uh, Kanemaru with a big shote and a Liger bomb for a big two count. Right right within the five, first five minutes, uh, Kanemaru recovers. And he hits one of his signature moves, a brain buster, for a big two count on Liger. So right off the gates, this match is going balls to the walls. Yeah, loved that. Loved the way he was just straight into it as well. And it's and it was great with the Liger bomb because he kind of almost does it in a slightly... And this is like a theme of the match in this quite dismissive way. Like he's just going to end this early. Um, and then it gets... I mean, it, it works kind of very, very cleverly of kind of getting, getting you into the match straight away. And it isn't... You know, one of the big criticisms we'd have is say of, uh, of like the last Akada Sonata match... Um, at time of recording, which had this very hot sequence at the beginning, and then it sort of goes into this very dull stretch. Here, starts off really good, um, has the brain buster there um, from from Kanemaru, and then it just allows Liger to kind of really go into Dick Heel when he starts to take over. Yeah, at, at some point, like uh, after this this um, this brain mm. buster, uh, uh, Kanemaru, you know, he, has, he decides to slow it down because they, they, they're going to go for a while. So he slows it down with a kind of a light looking uh, sleeper hold on Liger. But of course, like Liger's not going to be, you know, tapping <laughs> or falling asleep in the first 10 minutes of this match. Uh, uh, Kanemaru ties Liger into the Tree of Woe and hands uh, and lands a basement dropkick for a two count on him. He then applies a camel clutch. So at this point, he's kind of like going for these... Uh, like wearing down holes that work on Liger's neck, which makes sense because his two big moves are the uh, the Brain Buster and the Jumping DDT. Uh, I forget yep. the names. They're in my notes. So once I get to them, I'll, I'll tell everyone what the names of those moves <laughs> are. Uh, so like from here, uh, Liger is able to slap on uh, head scissors and then a side, uh, a side like leg lock on his head. Uh, his strategy seems to be wearing down... Uh, oh, sorry. Wait. Da, 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 uh, Kanemaru's neck for another Brain... Oh, no. So... Sorry, my my notes are jumping all over the place. I'm so excited to talk to you. Oh, JP. that's all right. I've it happens to me all the time. It'll happen to me a, a few times during this podcast. But uh, you're you're good. So so actually, so back to Liger. Liger reverses a whip, but uh, Katamaro ducks mm. a shote and escapes the tilt to world backbreaker by jumping kind of midair out of it. But Liger finally catches him with a beautiful capo kick that sends Katamaro to the outside. And from here, Liger hits a sliding drop kick, and then he hits a massive powerbomb on the floor <laughs> that just, you just hear yeah. this big thud. And I'm like, okay, Katamaro's dead. Yeah, it's great. That entire sequence, he, he kind of... It, after you've had that kind of relatively the match slowing down, it just sort of accelerates that point from after the, after the capo kick. And then he does that baseball slide, but it was great. The way then it, it just enables him to take control for a good period of time. And then kind of really sort of, you know, show the sort of lack of respect to it. But it was, it was great because um, I thought the way he delivered the, the power bomb, it's like he, he does kill him, but at the same time, 
there's like a, a healthy level of protection out there, which I think works really well because they have um, the the really slow count out that, uh, uh, in terms of of leaving leaving them in terms of beating the count as well. So it was it was at this point you could cut, they'd really sort of established the sort of face heel dynamic um, and and, within the match. Yeah, and Liger, is, you know, he doesn't get, you normally get to play the role of the the, the bully, right? The power wrestler. Mm. But he is mm. a little bit bigger than Kanemaru is. And so he's able to kind of like overpower him with like things like a brain buster and, and the power bombs. Cause this is like, like the second one he's hit on uh, Kanemaru in this match. So yeah, yeah. Kanemaru is like, you know, Liger gets back in the ring and the referee starts counting Kanemaru and, and he makes it in back by uh 19. I call this the, uh, one of ghetto's uh, specials, a uh, ghetto specials, the almost uh, <laughs> uh, the 19 count uh, from here. Yep. Uh, Liger hits another massive power bomb, number three, but doesn't go for the cover. Instead, he wants the ref to start getting a te- trying to get a, a knockout count on him, uh, tr- which would be a ten count if he uh, if Kanemaru can't recover. Yeah, I, I, and it's it's fantastic because he's just sort of quite dismissive in the corner. He doesn't even look kind of concerned. Just sort of telling the referee to go over and 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 um, count him out. Um, it, it's it's fantastic at, at this point. Like he's. He really bullies him again with the the power bomb he, he does just before then, just like um, him being nasty and then going straight into that um, German suplex straight after as well. It was like, yeah, really good dick work here from uh, Liger, if that can be an expression you can use. We can totally use that expression. Yeah, yeah. Like, like you're saying, so Kanemaru <laughs> gets up at eight. And like you're saying, JP, he, Liger makes him regret that decision because he just gives him this massive release. German suplex. At some point, it's kind of like almost Brock Lesnar. Like he just like jerks him up, releases him in midair, and so Kanemaru is just like flying uncontrollably backwards and just lands on his neck. It's it's a yeah. beautiful thing to see. You got you got to you got to love it. Uh, at this point, we see Akiyama. Jin Akiyama is like watching this match from near the backstage area. So it's it's kind of yeah. interesting. He's and it's because like they're in the same stable and like he wants Kanemaru to kind of get this. Like get our title back from that bastard Jushin Thunder Liger, and, and you know, don't worry. We're, Do you know it's the booze as well? Oh yeah, they there's hate thing, him. Yeah, the, the, there's that. It's like you're saying earlier on about you know, sort of uh, his heel turn. Yeah, and the fact that they they were booing him as well. I thought that was like a great thing to play into it. Oh yeah, and like when I call him a bastard, I know this is like his podcast series, like Jushin Liger's, but we say bastard in the nicest way possible. For sure. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, from here, uh, Liger puts Kanemaru on the top turnbuckle and follows up up there to hit a modified suplex for a big two count. He then applies uh, a seated stretch and transitions to a cradle for a two count. It's kind of like the seat, the stretch is kind of like a kind of a looser version of a, a stretch plum move. But then he he transitions it. And I, it's an, it's another example. Like, And I talk about this a lot in this series, JP. is like how great hmm. of a technical wrestler thunder liger is oh he's absolutely fantastic i loved these transitions into the pinfall attempt i mean he was just lovely and smooth and the and the way that he um the way he started he's, he really works him in from the abdominal stretch when he ends up doing the, the surfboard as well which i always think a, a move i always associate with liger that's one of the things that's kind of like the flashback to to my childhood as well but yeah Great Mac technician. And it's someone as well, at this stage of his career, he was, what, 40. So he had, like Muta, um, kind of adapted his style at this point in time. And it just says so much about him. I mean, the fact that, you know, he, he hasn't missed a, missed a beat at all. I, I'd, in fact, say, you know, at this stage, his it, in terms of his mat work, he was just, yeah, just tremendous stuff. Well, there's that whole, you know, argument you can make about, there's two periods of Liger's career. There's like pre-brain tumor and then there's post-brain yes. tumor. Pre-brain yeah. tumor, he's going nuts. He's like doing all he's, – he's invented the shooting star press. He's doing dives from the top turnbuckle to the to his opponent on the floor. He's like – he's just careless, reckless, and, and just extremely exciting as a high flyer. It's post, post-brain post tumor you know operation. Like he becomes like like – he relies less on his flying and more on his wrestling. And he, at some point, becomes, in my opinion, like I'm going to say like 96, 97, 98, around there, he becomes yeah. like one of the three best technical wrestlers on the planet, like along with, like in my, in my, the wrestling I was watching, along with Bret Hart and maybe Mitsuharu Misawa. Yeah. Yeah. Can com- 
completely go along with that as well. Yeah. Uh, from here, uh, like you're talking about, he does the surfboard, the Romero special. And I love this part when he like gets the guy up, he's on, flat on his back. He's got the guy up on all like, like hold pit. Like he's bridging his, his knees with his feet and he's grabbing the guy's arms. He's got them up. And then he kind of brings them back down on their knees. And then he applies a dragon sleeper on them. And the first time I saw this, I like popped out of my sofa seat. I was like, what the fuck is he doing? My God, I've never seen that. That looks so painful. Like to me, that could that should be a a finishing move in some respects. Yeah, yeah, he really, he really should have been. Um, but and, and Kanemaru's doing like absolutely tremendous job of just being effectively killed here at this point, being completely bullied at this stage. But it's, yeah, it's fantastic. You know, the thing about this, we, we're talking about the psychology where Liger is a heel and, mm. and Kanemaru is like the, the baby face, but it's it's really. It's, it's really a testament to both these guys, like how they're able to shift that sentiment because Kanemaru is a really ugly dude. Yeah, he is. He's There isn't any... If you look at him, there's like nothing particularly special about him other than that's the, the trait they kind of work into getting him over as a face here um, in, in, in the fact that he looks like the kind of everyman. And he isn't, like you say, he's not He's not a pretty guy. You'd argue he looks prettier now. He's got sort of a full head of hair in him as opposed to uh, at this stage. But, yeah, they, the way they work the sympathy, um, I just love the the fact as, again, as the match starts to go on, you end up with Liger just being more and more sort of dickish to him. Like, it's just like got a complete lack of respect for, for Kanemaru. And it's, it, yeah, and just sort of really heating it up. Well, it comes to a point where, like, you can tell he's getting frustrated that he can't put this guy away. He's just hitting him yeah. with everything, and it's like he's getting more and more angry at Kanemaru. He's also getting more disdainful of him at the same time, I believe, as well. Uh, from yeah. here, uh, like, uh, let's see, uh, oh, Kanemaru uh, escapes another powerbomb attempt from Liger and hits uh, Liger's left knee with a basement dropkick. Uh, Liger mm-hmm. retaliates with a backdrop driver. Uh, Kanemaru blocks another superplex and hits a sunset flip powerbomb uh, of his own onto Liger. So he he's retaliating finally. He gets to get a powerbomb on Liger. Fuck you for all those, you know, all those powerbombs <laughs> you hit on me, especially the one outside. Uh, let's see. Uh, he hits, ah, the, it's called the Deep Impact, uh, JP. The, the jumping the DDT. DDT. Yeah, the DDT yeah. is called the Deep Impact. He gets that on him. Uh, Kanemaru goes for a moonsault, but Liger rolls out of the way. Uh, Liger tries for a small package for a close two count here. Uh, Liger tries a ground cobra twist for a two count. So, like, we're not even... I, I wouldn't even say we're ha- at the crescendo of this match, but, like, Liger's... You can just tell he's desperate. It's real... And it's and subconsciously, it's getting Kanemaru over because, like, oh, my God, the fans are realizing... This guy is going toe to toe with this absolute legend in Japanese wrestling. Yeah, it is. It, it's it's a masterful job of in terms of what he was there to do in terms of having the most credibility out of um, out of any junior in the world. So it's certainly within within Japan to put over who you want to be your um, the who's going to be the guy taking the title off him. Um, it's just fantastic. I mean. It's great because I don't think they don't burn themselves out at this point. It's still not moving at a kind of it does. It's not the point where you think, oh, we're entering the home stretch and things start to really speed up and there's a lot of reversals. At the same time, it still comes across as as much more of a fight, um, which I like about this. There wasn't like lots of what you would think of, of as the sensational. I mean, in terms of the deep impact DDT leading into the. Um, into the moonsault as well. I mean, that's a lot of the times it's not about the spectacular in this. And I think that's what Liger manages to do is, is just sort of show himself to be sort of so masterful at getting Kanemaru over to the level where even like we're going to go into sort of the brain buster series where they start to mean so much and the crowd reactions for those. Definitely. Uh, from here, Liger hits a top rope Frankensteiner, but Kanemaru is able to roll through that and gets a close two on Liger himself. Liger hits two shotes and then hits a top rope fisherman buster. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, and, but Kanemaru kicks out at one. Oh shit. It's on now, JP. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's absolutely fun. Yeah. I liked it. There'll be some people, and and when you read some of the reviews of this match and what and what pe- what people thought of it, and some people get really annoyed about the one count stuff. But I was, to be honest, I was completely there. 
I was absolutely loving it. Yeah, it was oh, those, great. Stuff. Those people are all meme wrestler like nerds, and they all like you know grapple fucking and stuff like that. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't take anything they say into uh, into account. No. Let's, let's let's just move on, anyways. But and, look, <laughs> but you know what? They might like like that. But guess what? I my notes here says the crowd is really coming alive. And the at- yes. and, but you know like you're saying the atmosphere throughout this match from the start has been pretty hot like these people are yeah. well up for this junior heavyweight title match yeah they are I mean it's not kind of like molten hot but at the same time it, it's it, it's not positioned to be the molten hot match on the card so it, but the crowd is definitely there there's no point you ever get the feeling that the crowd are lost during this. There's like even even earlier on in the match where, you know, it's it's more methodical and you've got Liger working over Kanemaru and Kanemaru working over Liger. Here at this at this stage, it's like they've been brought up really well at this point. Cause it would have been about what, sort of the fifteen minute mark or something when when you know, when we've got a lot of the the, the kind of um exchanges. It's absolutely fantastic. It's really great. Yeah. Uh, Kanemaru hits a brain buster on Liger, but guess what? Liger kicks out at one. <laughs> Yeah. Fuck you, critics. I'm kicking out at one, too. Uh, Liger tries for a shote, but uh, Kanemaru grabs his arm to block it. And from here, Liger, to break the grip, just slaps the shit out of Kanemaru's, like the taste out of his mouth, essentially. He then connects with another shote, turning Kanemaru inside out. But L- Liger doesn't pin him. Oh, no. He instead hits a brain buster on Kanemaru for a one, a two. Oh. Kanemaru kicks out, but it's a very close kick out at two. So those, those uh, nerds who don't like the kick out at once are, should be happy with that, JP. Yeah. Yeah, it really builds into it. It's going to take multiple finishers to take to take the other guy out because of, that's the importance of the match. And guess what? The crowd is going nuts now. They are yeah. super hot for this match at this point. Uh, Liger puts Kanemaru on the top rope and tries for a top rope brain buster, but uh, Kanemaru is able to fight him off. And, and knock him back down to the mat. Liger gets up. He tries again. But this time, uh, Kanemaru catches him and hits a top rope DDT. Whoa! Moonsault! And then Kanemaru hits it this time, but only a two. So, like, before, Liger rolled out, but Kanemaru connects. And he has a very, very nice-looking moonsault. Yeah, he does. Yeah. It was a really nice sort of sequence going from the, the DDT off the second rope, the sort of second rope deep impact, um, into the moonsault as well. He was really sweet. I... There's no stage during this match as well. I thought, oh, well, they're kind of losing themselves or they're tired and they're making these kind of mistakes. Certainly not to the degree where it became particularly noticeable. And if if they did at any stage, they made it work within the match. I mean, he is a he's a smooth worker as Kanemaru. Not a looker, as you say, but certainly. Well, he's like, this is kind of his peak. Like, he... It is. Yeah, you know, now in 2019, Kanemaru is you don't really see it anymore. He's he's too much like into the gimmick of being a heel and 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 drinking the yeah. whiskey and spitting the whiskey. Now I'm not a huge fan of him these days, but you know when he's motivated in a singles match, he actually will bring back the 2004 version of himself sometimes. Uh, yeah. Why don't we Why don't we uh, let you take it out from here because it's like kind of the closing stretch now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I think it's. It, if I'm right in thinking, it's Kanemaru hits him with uh, another brain buster that only gets two. Oh no, sorry, he gets that, and then he roll. He get he roll. He does one brain buster, and then rolls into the second one. Does a sort of spinning brain buster, and Kanemaru wins it. Uh, Seventeen thirty eight was the match time for it, um, and I really enjoyed it. Um, absolutely, absolutely loved it. I thought it was uh, yeah. Really fun, really fun match. It's actually, it's not the best match on the card. You could argue that it's kind of possibly about even third best match on the card. But for me, it's like kind of reminds me of the wrestling channel. It reminds me of seeing Noah for the first time and then seeing these sort of Japanese stadium shows as well. So it, it had that kind of big match atmosphere. Crowd popping behind as well. Um, Liger's pretty much out of there at the same time. Um, yeah. Hey, great stuff. I think his brain buster called the touch out. That's the name of his. Oh, brain is that what it is? The, the touch the out. Touch out. Yeah. 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 And he does the, yeah, he, he, yeah he, with the little spin into it as it well. It was kind of like Eddie Guerrero's like three amigos, right? So, yeah. So it's kind of like he, he does the first brain buster, which looks awesome, but then he just like hip swivels. He's keeping contact with Liger and then he yeah, does the second one. It looks, which also looks brutal and beautiful. And then that's the, the finish of the match. He gets the one, two, three. He reclaims the Global Honor Crown Junior Heavyweight title in 1738. And, and he's doing it for all the fans 
And he's doing it for all the boys in the back. And most importantly, he's doing it for the Suntory whiskey uh, that he's going to be drinking uh, copious <laughs> amounts of afterwards uh, at the after party. <laughs> the crowd is ecstatic. Like, like you know, they're just yeah. so happy. You, you can see it on camera. You can hear it on the speakers of your telephone or, or, or sorry, your television or on your computer. It's just fantastic, fantastic match. I love this match. It, it really to me is one of like Liger's best matches of this era of his career. Yeah. I'd absolutely go along with it. Um, at this point in time, it was, it, it did everything it needed to do. I mean, in a sense, he couldn't have done more. I mean, it was, you know, a case where he came out, he, he worked a dominant style, something that he wouldn't have necessarily been doing all that much. And he manages to get over the hometown guy. And the thing that, I that I love about it as well, and you mentioned it at the start of the show. In terms of that crowd loyalty, um, of of like going against the invader, and it was reminding me of a lot of stuff. And sort of doing a bit of research for this as well, um, it reminded me back. I found myself watching um, the match he has against Segura at the Dome in January to win the belt initially, and you know he's very much the face there, and Segura and the other Noah guys who are outside with him, including Kanemaru, all booed. Um, it reminded me of the brawl the at the G1 finals. I want to say in 2016, with um, with like with, uh, with, Nakajima and, and Goshizaki. And, and all uh, yeah, guys. that's right. And Shibata, yeah, and Maybach Tan- Taniguchi was there as well. God, but the kind of level of heat that it had always been things that I, I kind of always loved and always missed. But then it worked badly for Noah when they ended up putting Suzuki gun over and it, it, you know, to the detriment where the fans didn't want to see their guys being beaten all of the time, but used at this point in time, it was kind of perfect for what they wanted to do in terms of getting a face champion over who is, you know, who's their guy who's eventually going to be there really to put the belt onto Marafuji at at, at that, at that stage or like the the thing help. Marafuji become the ace. Sorry, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Like, uh, no, 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 no. Of course. The the thing about Liger in the 2000s. So, like in in previous episodes, mm. I talked about the, the the tag match he has where he's teaming with Takahiro Murahama from from Osaka Pro Wrestling, and they're taking on an Osaka Pro tag team called Infinity. Oh yeah, Subasa and Black Buffalo, and Liger is just doing everything in his power to get all the other three guys from Osaka Pro because it's on Osaka Pro show. He's doing everything in his power not to make himself the star. He's there to enhance like everyone else. So he's as Murahama's tag partner. He's giving Murahama as much shine as he can without like, you know, depriving the fans of like something they want to see, which is him interacting with Subasa and, and Black Buffalo. But also like he's getting, he's letting Black Buffalo and Subasa hit all their signature moves on him. He's doing everything in his power to get these guys over the match he has with Great Sasuke where, you know, he's the legend and Sasuke is kind of the up and coming guy. He does everything in his power to get the fans on his side and to get him mm. over and to have him survive all of his offense. Like he, he doesn't have to do these things, JP. You know, like he is one of the most generous wrestlers in the history of the business. Yep. Yep. And I've seen, we've seen him do it over here. Seen him do it for, for younger wrestlers um, within um, Europe, whether it be Scotty Davis and an OTT. I think, um, you know, even a, a, an El Fantasma before we've seen him, you know, be more than willing to kind of help young talent and help them get over. And he's done that throughout his career. And that's, if you're thinking of the legacies of the things that you take away, it's the amount of respect that he has um, and the amount of, of people that he's like of this younger generation of wrestlers, how many of them he's worked with that like, you know, you're thinking of, you know, a lot of the, the juniors who we kind of take as commonplace, there would have been a point in time, where he would have worked with them as well. And companies wanted to work with him. How many companies has he worked with around the world? It's quite incredible. And it's and it's not like any of them have a bad word to say about him. Well, he got, he got to do an NXT show while he was yeah. a contracted wrestler with New Japan for Wrestling. And they, they, had, they used his name. They didn't have to make him change his name. He did one off against you know Tyler Breeze, yeah. which I covered on the, uh, the Sarah Flynn episode of this series. But it, it's <laughs> amazing. It's amazing like how much respect he gets and you and you know like all these younger wrestlers if if they they probably want to say you can beat me i i will i will take the pinfall on this and liger's probably like no no no, you're the future you're beating me yeah exactly completely knew what was what was best 
for for the business as well. And 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 like you mentioned, even at the start of it, he'd had these five successful title defenses. They built to it well with him getting through some of the 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 lesser juniors within the division at that point in time. In some of the in, in some of those defenses, I always think he defends against. Does he defend against Nakajima in that time as well? Like sixteen year old Nakajima. I can't remember. I, the, uh, I, I didn't actually. Oh, sorry. Oh. I get to expose myself. I didn't actually research his title defenses for this reign. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. But you know no, what? No, don't worry. It's called yeah. Cage Match. Go look it up, folks. You can, you can yeah, take, exactly. Take, take a look there. It's out there for, one, don't one, be relying on us. One last point, and before we wrap mm. things up, is that, you know, like, it's been said, like, a lot of the times, like, New Japan Junior Dome matches, you know, like at Wrestle Kingdom. Mm. Are, are don't have a great atmosphere. They tend to get lost in that building. But I, I kind of think that's bullshit. I don't know what it is, but this match, this is happens in the Tokyo Dome too. This match had a ton of heat that you don't normally see for a junior match that happens on a New Japan show, which is weird. I would agree with that. And I think part of the problem might well have been, being honest, it's some of the storylines they're going in with. This had the most simplest of storyline. It had... Invader takes title. Invader comes in, is dismissive to challengers along the way, and then meets his match in um, in one of the hometown promotions guy. And then you build to the big match that way. There's a, it's got a wonderful simplicity for it that the audience can completely get. Whereas I think it, you look at times in terms of some of the storytelling around the junior belt, like you wonder – how it's been positioned on the card. Is it there to kind of showcase the spectacular at times? And I, I think what they could really do, what they could really do with, because I think it would get the kind of peak for it, is kind of work in, work in a proper story. What they do this year, God knows. But um, I think that's something, if you're thinking about how this works and how other junior matches haven't worked in the Dome. Yeah, I, I think it comes down to possibly just even then, what stories are they telling? Yeah, I mean, like you're saying, I think that you hit you hit it right on the head. It's the story. It's the story of Liger is the New Japan guy who holds the Noah title, and Kanemaru is the Noah guy trying to get this title back at you know Noah's biggest show. So you're hoping that he's going to accomplish yeah. it, at, at, you know, on this huge stage for for like pro wrestling Noah. Yeah. Um, before we wrap up, let me let's talk about like Liger is going to retire on uh, mm-hmm. January sixth in 2020 at the Oda. Uh, city uh, Oda, Oda City Gymnasium for New Year's Dash, which is being moved to that building this uh, this coming January. But January mm-hmm. 5th is slated to be his last match. It's it's slated, rumored to be slated to be a singles match. And, and JP, I want to know mm. what what do you what are you thinking is going to happen, or and what is your dream last opponent for Jushin Thunder Liger? Um. Oh, this is really, really tough. Um, what do I think they'll do? Um, mm. and for a long time, I was convinced it was going to be Suzuki. And obviously, they've gone through that storyline. So there is still the part of me that wonders whether or not it, would he have that one last challenge for the junior title um, against a Will Ospreay thing is like at one stage I was convinced it was going to be Osprey versus Zach. So I wondered whether or not they were going to do Will Osprey and, and in terms of having someone in there to have sort of a great match with as the last one, that might be the most sort of fitting service that there is. Um dream match wise, uh it's really interesting, isn't it? It makes me wonder whether or not Great Sasuke would be able to go through. The last time I saw him, he was trying to kill himself at Joey Janela's. Um, so I wonder whether or not someone like a Great Sasuke, but I think that wouldn't necessarily be there. So I, do you know what? I would say Will Ospreay. Yeah, okay. I'm going to I'm gonna say, like, I like your idea, and I thought about it a lot myself, that, that Will Ospreay and him still being the champion, him saying, I can see him saying, I want to face you in your last match. If I beat whoever I'm facing on January fourth, I'm still a champion. I want to face you for the title, and like, and if he, and the thing is, is, is if Liger wins, I don't think he will. I think he'll put over Will Ospreay. Yeah. But if he won, and then he just vacates the title, and they have a tournament for it, that that would be perfectly fine because you would have you could you don't need that belt really. You're like it, it's not necessarily a draw. It's it's, it's part of the card, so you could have yeah. the the you know the 2020 best of the super juniors. Be for 
to fill the vacant title, right? Crown a new champion. I think that would be yeah. a really, really interesting, you know, storyline. I think it would make the best of super juniors that year, like so much more, not more interesting. Last year's was, was like this past year's was really good, but it would, it would just add more juice to a tournament, wouldn't it? If it was for the title. And then if it was for the title that Liger vacated, like he, he retired as the champion, that would be a great story. I think. I think so. And I think it's almost a way, I mean, Osprey's been great at kind of putting over people and working hard necessarily than in these tournaments. I don't necessarily think it's the worst way of getting the, the belt off Osprey. And I also think the exposure for Osprey being Liger's last opponent in, in the dome. I think that is something that is, it's hard to think outside of sort of being in one of the top two main events, how that can't be bigger you could argue whether or not a junior match against Hiromu would be necessarily the way to go. But I think having, having that with Liger, um, I think you can, you can have sort of the, the kind of relatively magical nostalgic moment. And I don't think Osprey would lose anything by being in that position. And like, so I really like the idea of then having the best of the super juniors, juniors tournament for that. Cause again, you can have an absolutely outstanding field. And if it could be anywhere close to this year, you could have, you know, seriously outstanding stuff yeah and like maybe if we go through that that idea that you know osprey puts over liger in his last match and liger wins the title from mm-hmm. him, then maybe that's osprey's last match as a junior heavyweight and then he moves yep. to heavyweight on new year's dash he says i'm going to become a heavyweight and i'm and he beats someone big on on the new year's dash show the next day during you know which will have liger's retirement ceremony on it exactly and i do you know what and i think that would be a really great great way for um for that to happen as well because yeah you'd imagining on that new year's dash show it should be really osprey in the position of kind of working him into a a heavyweight feud yeah that should be like you know like what they did with jay white at previous new year dashes and what they did with yeah. omega at, where he became a heavyweight he you know he, he turned on uh, aj and he beat nakamura that that should be Osprey's New Year's Dash, where he gets to that, he's getting the push as a serious heavyweight, and mm. he he's done with it. I I think it would be a great final chapter for him to have the match with Liger. So I, I I'm going to go with that's my dream match as well, JP. That Osprey yeah. versus Liger. I was going to ask you that. What other ones have you had in mind? Uh, I I was thinking Jericho actually. Oh. Yeah, I could go along with that. Just mentioning of that, going, oh God, actually, that's. That'd be a pretty great show. But I want I want to see AEW Jericho. I don't want to see New Japan Jericho. There's a big difference. I'm good with that. Yeah. I'm loving AEW Jericho at the moment. He is great. I I I honestly I be honest with you. I hate Jericho and New Japan for wrestling. I just think his character mm. New Japan for wrestling is every like dickhead foreigner that you and I were talking about off air. Mm. That's who he is yeah. in, in in New Japan. Right. That's his character in in AEW. He's like this conniving amazing wrestler that you hate because he's better than everyone not because he's like uh, a foul mouth like entitled like you know dickhead foreigner who's who, che- who cheats and brawls a lot he doesn't really actually wrestle jericho and aw wrestles a lot he's just better than everyone else but you hate him because you don't want to like him exactly yeah i could i could really get involved with that like you say as well i think it would it would enable the match to perhaps be a bit wild and i would that that's some of the things that that Jericho kind of needs to a degree. I think some of the the last couple of outings, the Akada, uh, was it Akada and Evil and, and Naito? That for me, they've always sort of been slightly underwhelming. And I think in this case, like Liger as well, you can imagine what Jericho would would do in that match. Just thinking about what that match would mean to him personally. And I kind of sometimes joke that I hope it's like Jericho under the uh, Super Liger mask again. Oh, he could do a run out. Super he could Liger? to build that match if he's in the audience. Do you remember? That, do you remember Super mask. Liger? I I say remember. I can remember seeing stuff about Super Liger. My first time seeing Super Liger was in a Power Slam magazine. I'm. Do you know what? That's exactly what I'm. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Where I might well have seen it. Might well have been Power Slam. Oh, that would be. 
oh, we've put this feud. He's got a couple of cracking directions to go in. I think New Japan, one of those get, two. Just get rid of those two losers, Ghetto and Dino. Yeah. You hire WH and JP, the initial men, yeah, the initial men bookers of all of pro wrestling. <laughs> we will, <laughs> we will make the U.S. expansion work. We, we will, we will save Brit Res with New Japan pro wrestling and, and, and so forth and so on. Yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll 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 take over the wrestling world, but in a nicer way. Yes, in, in no no uh, co opting either, but in a, no. in, in a friendly way. But uh, <laughs> let's wrap it up here, JP. Where can yep. people find more of yourself? Um, so you can find me on the uh, on Twitter at JPGP. That's spelled J P J I P three E's, and uh, you can listen to us weekly. Um, we're at Grapple Spotlight. I think it's grapple.podbean.com, I want to say. But you can also find us if you just search for Grapple Spotlight, no E at the end of it. And I record that with um, Post Wrestling's Benno and Joe Lemon, um, who have mentioned before. Um, it's normally a lot of nonsense, um, but we've – yeah, by the way, we don't watch any WWE now at this stage. So it's it's actually become a little bit more positive, I think, in terms of wrestling over the last yeah, couple uh, of weeks. So. You, guys are, you guys are smart ones. I, I don't have to watch WWE because I don't have to no. cover anything. I only cover Japanese wrestling on post wrestling. So. I feel for John and Wei. I, do, I do. really feel for them sitting through that. I'm surprised, like, I don't know, they're not drinking heavily on the job you know the thing, it, would, it would get to me the thing with john way is like they they enjoy talking to each other and they enjoy talking to the fans and 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 they enjoy like being like you know bring out the snarkiness and the sarcastic <laughs> natures that's yeah. wwe main roster will definitely bring that out in you but uh yeah i'm glad i don't have to do it i would probably end up drinking i'm not a big drinker i probably end up yes. like just becoming a high function or maybe a low functioning alcoholic if i had to watch wwe main roster stuff but but i do not but i, I want to say grapple spotlight fantastic show i it's an easy download thank you right away i listen to it 70 like not 45% of it, I don't understand what you're talking about because it's all <laughs> British culture stuff and I, over my I head. Apologize, I apologize for that, but I promise you that we probably won't end up stopping with it. You're going to get more football anecdotes <sighs> okay. and stuff like and soaps. Sorry. No, no. It, 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 as long as you start talk, talking about the Watchmen, because we were talking about that off air, yeah. it'll be okay. So make sure Benno and, and Joe are start watching Watchmen. You guys talk about like it for. 10 15 minutes and i'll be i'll be super happy i'll listen to all the talk about you know ronaldo or whoever the fuck is in the footy game at, over in england and stuff, <laughs> you know but uh my name is wh park yeah you can find me at wh park nine of course like, you can hear me every month with john doing the post perez podcast on uh, postwrestling.com and uh for jp i want to thank all the listeners for tuning in to this particular episode and and for tuning in throughout the series it's it's been really great to hear all your feedback and until the next episode, I will say to everyone, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>